let's pray for a moment and clear our minds. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Americans really love the idea of freedom. And as we come into summer, a lot of us want to look forward to our vacations and getting out of the office and getting away, especially those who have been teachers and working in education. Summer can be a beautiful, beautiful time. So we've been talking about how freedom is great, but we can only get to freedom that we can all enjoy when we also get to justice for all. God sent prophets to share God's desire for justice and how we will have freedom when we live with justice. Next slide. So every week I have come up with motorcycle jokes. This week, two guys are, reading, are riding along on their motorcycle and they were stopped by a policeman who said, what do you think you're doing? And they're like, um, we're riding really fast. And the policeman says, what if you have an accident? And the priest said, don't worry, my son. God is with us. And the policeman says, well, in that case, I need to arrest you. Three is too many to ride on one motorcycle. The question for us this week, is God on our motorcycle? Are we as a church riding with God? Are each one of us individually riding with God in our lives? The comic strip on the screen suggests that some people have the power to decide with freedom. Obviously, one guy is deciding what's fair, and clearly the other person is not getting the benefit of the first guy's freedom. So are we running our church with the power of God? Or are we trying to get by on our own resources? Next slide. So when you read through the book of Amos, the most famous verse was part of what we read today. Let fairness or righteousness flow like a mighty stream, like a river. Let there be oceans full of fairness. Now one of the things I learned about Amos this week as I was studying for the Bible study and the sermon is that it is a prophetic book that is more about the social and political freedoms, justice, way of life for the community, and less about the religious. Hosea was a prophet that really talked about the religious practices of the Jewish people, and Amos was more social and political, which means that a lot of people have found the message of Amos very relevant in today's world. Martin Luther King drew upon it heavily, a lot of the liberation theologists from Central and South America based a lot of their theological understanding on the book of Amos. And so it's a book that a lot of people still feel is relevant today. But as you read the book and you hear God's call for us to be fair, I look around today and I think, where does fairness come in today's world? How are we given the opportunity to live fairly with people around us. Our social principles struggle with this as well. How do we find economic fairness in a capitalistic system, a way that continues to provide enough for everyone and still be a thriving, flourishing economic system for all people? These are not easy questions. Some of us turn to the legal code or our culture for what is fair. I think Amos is calling us to turn to God, to make sure that God is riding with us on our motorcycle when we're making these decisions. When I was looking at all this Play-Doh, getting ready for the children's sermon, you know, I have to say, I think toddlers have the best system of fairness. I mean, even when you watch 18-month-olds, they know what's right and wrong. They know when they've taken a toy away from someone. They know when someone has hurt them. They know fairness. They know justice. And at what point did we lose that sense of wanting to keep working for fairness in all parts of our adult lives? Next slide. Now there's a line in Joel, the last section that Alberto read, that is the most famous section out of that prophet's message. This idea that the Holy Spirit is going to come and bring gifts 
for every person, no matter who they are, no matter their age, no matter their gender. For all of the churches who say women should not speak in church, I would turn them to the book of Joel because it's clear that the Holy Spirit is bringing messages to young women as well as to young men. But I'm also always moved that the old men will also see visions. Joel reminds us that God still has a purpose for every person in our community, both our church community and our broader community. There is a place for all of us. All of us have been equipped with a gift from God. And there needs to be a place in our systems where we encourage everyone to be a part and engage. But I have to admit that when I look around our culture today, it seems like we are often putting up barriers based on some idea that we have of who should or should not be doing something. Right now in seminary, I'm finishing up a class on New Testament in the women in the New Testament. And one of the things that has really struck me is that most of the women who are talked about in the New Testament are never named. And we know the power of a name. And to be honest, I know for myself, and you can tell me afterwards if you agree, I've always paid more attention to the 12 men who were the disciples because all 12 of them were named. Now beyond the first four or five, we never hear anything about the other ones in the Bible. We get their name, but we know nothing of their faith story, of their journey, of, the, of their mission, what they went on to do. But what my class has come to help me see, when I read through the Gospels now, time after time after time, a woman shows up in faith, takes an action, asks for something from Jesus, is granted it, and Jesus says, you are healed, go forth, your faith has made you whole. Now the women may not be named, but they were the illustrations that showed the male disciples what it meant to live a life of faith. How often in our world are there people that we don't pay full attention to because we don't know their names, we don't understand their cultures, there's something that just isn't a part of us and we are missing out on God working in them. Joel reminds us to not have any barriers, to always be looking for how the Holy Spirit is working in every person. When we met with our church coach this last week, one of the things that she lifted up um, is that we really need to, as we continue to grow, keep talking about the vision that we've been given for this church. Because in some ways, we are prophets ourselves, like Amos and Joel. God has given us a ministry here in La Crosse in 2021. And we need to keep reminding ourselves of what this is. And so I'd like to talk about this today because Amos has this message of fairness and holiness in our community. And Joel has this message that every person has a gift from God to contribute. So what does it mean to be a church today in the United States in the 2020s? It seems like the church is collapsing all around us. Even we are being birthed out of the remnants of a previous congregation. What is the vision that we have from God to continue doing ministry work? Next slide. So there's a question that a lot of people have been asking for about 20 years now as the church in the United States has been diminishing, especially in the last 10, when it seems to have gone off a cliff as far as participation by people in the community. And I pulled up some notes that I had taken from a training seminar led by Curtis Brown. And he is an elder from the New England Conference. He is currently living in the state of Washington where his wife is a church planter with a church outside a military base. Now, if you want an exciting church plant, she has 100% turnover of her congregation every 18 months. Now, not all at the same time, it's you know, people come and go. But within an 18 month period, she has a completely new congregation. 
So if they're making disciples and transforming the world, the clock ticks the minute they meet someone, and they've got 18 months before that person will be moving on to a new deployment. That is an exciting church plant. I think ours feels pretty laid back and relaxed when we think about that. But he works for Path One, which is the church planting arm of the United Methodist Church in the United States. So he goes all over the U.S. helping to plant churches and train church leaders of how to grow healthy churches in today's culture. And he had a couple things that I thought were really interesting that I think will help us clarify and hold on to our vision. One of the first things he said was, wherever people are seeking the values of God, we will see it through the fruit of the Spirit. When people are seeking God, the Holy Spirit comes and brings the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit are things like joy and peace, self-control, gentleness, faithfulness. There's a beautiful list in Galatians. There was a time when my kids would start fighting and to get them to stop, I'd say, okay, name all the fruits of the Spirit. And by the time they'd gotten through the whole list, they'd forgotten what they were fighting about. So that's the free parenting tip of the day. The Holy Spirit is already bringing forth a new church in this new culture that is emerging in the United States. We don't have to necessarily figure it all out. We just need to be faithful and look for the fruit of the Spirit and engage in those places. The institutional church will come along later and organize it and give it a name and give it rules and regulations and everything. But our job is to go where God is already there and God is already at work and people are already seeking. Another thing that I was, thought was really interesting, we often think about the different types of churches. There are the evangelicals and there's the Catholics and then there's all those other Protestants, Protestants who aren't Catholic and aren't evangelical. And he said in a lot of communities, when you have a declining marketplace, stores will start closing and consolidating. Think about Walmart coming in and all the small stores close, but then over time, Walmart often closes and has a bigger super center in another place. Walmart doesn't grow the market. Walmart isn't expanding, it's just consolidating the decline. And in a lot of our communities, the decline of Christianity has been consolidated into a few larger Catholic, evangelical, and mainline Protestant churches. But it's not growing. It's not going in new directions, and it's not connecting with people who've been rejected by church, who have left the church, or maybe who've never even been part of a church. The last thing that he said that I thought was really interesting is that when you think of this and you think of this consolidation, you really end up with a situation where people are, they're just shrinking into human frameworks, institutions that people have created, churches that have been around for generations, perhaps even hundreds of years. But you're not following the Holy Spirit, the power, the passion, the fire of the Holy Spirit always. And this was, I thought, the most interesting line of the entire two-day training with him. We want, as we are growing churches now, we want to lower the bar of how church is done and raise the bar of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. How many of us have been part of churches where it is a whole lot of work just to keep the doors open, just to get to the committee meetings? What if we made church simpler, but made it more meaningful to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Now, if we think about the people we know who don't go to church, is that the church they're actually looking for and interested in? I know a lot of people who really like the message of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus, the meaning and the purpose. And is that the direction that we can go as a church? Next slide. So we are trying to build a church with the Holy Spirit. We are trying to discover what God is doing and we're trying to work with God. Why bother? For a lot of us, we've already come to see the benefits of salvation and eternal life. We look for a transformation of lives and communities. 
um, of purpose and meaning and grace and God's love and grace in our lives. So the vision for our church, and actually, Randy, this is entirely not your fault. I reorganized my sermon, and I didn't reorganize the slides. So I'm going to quick jump ahead. Not your fault. Totally my fault. So in 2016, um, when I started here as a pastor, I also started a year-long training program in church planting. And one of the first sessions was on visioning and how to ask God for a vision and listen for the vision and then implement the vision. I was in Madison, and the presenter, um, it was about 1.30 in the afternoon, 2 o'clock after lunch, and the presenter knew we were all getting a little snoozy from a very good lunch we'd all had. So he told us to stand up to pray to God for a vision for our church plants and then to go take a 20-minute walk around downtown Madison. Well, I'm a Gen Xer, and I'm a little skeptical about prayer on demand and visions on demand from God. And I really didn't think this was going to work. But I also was taught by my parents to do what my teachers told me to do. <laughs> so I stood up, and I said a prayer. I said, God... I'm supposed to ask you for a vision. I really don't think you're going to come through, but, you know, I'm doing it anyway. I mean, I can't say it was the most faithful prayer in my life. And before I'd even walked out of the conference room that we were in, I had this vision of bridges all over my head. I saw all kinds of bridges. Now, I had just moved to La Crosse like a year earlier. I did not at that time understand fully how important bridges were in the city of La Crosse, especially for those of you who drive from Iowa or work in La Crescent um, or do other things in Minnesota. The bridges are really, really important here. At the time, I didn't know it. So I've got these bridges dancing around my head, and I don't know what to do with it. And so I'm like, okay, that's great, God, but like, I don't wa know what to do next. So I just let it sit for a while. And two years later, a few of us were dreaming about the future of our church. And someone said, you know, I think we need to get rid of our name. Our name used to be Wesley United Methodist Church. Two reasons. One is, in today's world, what does Wesley mean? Most people don't know who John Wesley is. Most Methodists don't even know who John Wesley is. So, like, you know, how is this going to draw new people into our church? Number two, there were a certain group of people in town who knew that Wesley Church had gone through some really tough times. So the name also had some negative baggage in the community. So really not a great reach out and connect, touch your neighbor type of thing. And I looked at her, and, and all of a sudden the light went off. I'm like, Bridges, now I know what to do with this vision. <laughs> it's supposed to be our new name. And as Randy pointed out, she loved it because our name is our mission. Our mission is to build bridges to God and community. Just by the name of our church, we could remember what our purpose was. Now, as we were trying to figure out who we were going to be as a church, we're like, okay, so that's a great mission, but, like, how do we do it? Like, there's the organizing the church thing, and there's the being the disciple thing, and how do we do it where the organizing the church thing doesn't overcome the being the disciple thing? And one of our people came up with this great statement. We're going to do this as a simple and inclusive community for spiritual growth. It's not about a building. It's not about a specific place. It's not about a particular denomination, or it's just anyone who's looking for spiritual growth can come, and we're going to be together and we're going to just figure out how to go forward together. And finally, we identified five tools, five spiritual practices that Jesus used with his disciples that have stood the test of time and are actually traditional United Methodist vows that are part of our membership, praying, learning, giving, serving, and sharing. So this was the vision we were given to become a church in La Crosse in 2021 where we can grow in justice and we can grow in inclusion and we can do what we want to do. Now, Randy, can you get back to the one thumbprint on the bridge? One more. There we go. 
So what we encourage people to do is take that first step onto a bridge. Start building your own bridge to God and community. Be intentional about your own spiritual life. Take ownership of it and say, you know, I'm going to start working on this. But the thing about a bridge is that you can't really have a half-built bridge. You're not going to get anywhere, and it's going to fall apart pretty quickly. And for most of us, we have a hard time building a bridge by ourselves. Next slide. And so here at Bridges Church, we've organized ourselves in such a way that we welcome anyone to come and be part of us, and we'll call you a member and you can be part of us at any stage you find yourself on your journey. And if you need another person to help you build your bridge, we want to provide that person. But for the second people who are, have built enough of their bridge that they feel confident to start helping another person, we have a type of membership that we call professing membership. It's the official formal membership in the United Methodist Church. And these people make a commitment not just to themselves to keep growing, but also to grow the church, to grow and help other people build their bridges. So our professing members make a public statement of their faith, and then they are the ones that are on our leadership team, they're the ones who vote at meetings, they're the ones that keep our ministries going, and they're the ones who are there to reach out their hand and help other people build their bridges. Next slide. And then we have a bridge with lots of people of all sizes. <laughs> growing together no matter where their bridge is at in their own spiritual journey, we can all be building this bridge together. And this is who we are. This is the vision that we have been given of raising the bar but making our church easier. So now you can move to the chat slide. So we're going to do our three minutes of chat. Oh, there, there's our five spiritual practices, but yes, move to the chat one. One more. Perfect. And let's take three minutes, and either with the people online in the chat room or the people here, or if you just want to meditate with yourself on these questions, what is your vision of church in today's world? And where are you most excited about growing with God and community? Or maybe a better thing you'd like to talk about are what are your stories of connection using one of our spiritual practices? So why don't we take three minutes? Well, I'm sorry. I, it sounds like you guys could keep going for quite a while. And I hate to cut this short, but feel free to carry this on. I'd like to just complete with this one thought. That God is riding with us on our journey through justice to freedom. And that we can listen to the voices of Amos and Joel who promise that God will help us who, when we ask for help and will provide a vision to guide us to heal our broken relationships and build connections. So this week, let's work with God's power, with Jesus on our motorcycle, and let's bring God's grace and love to more people who are hungry for God's justice. Next slide. So let's say together the very old-timey revival camp uh, phrase that Methodists have used for generations, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. At this point, we're going to move into a time of uh, response, and we're going to begin with the old hymn, I Surrender All. <laughs> 